Welcome to United Body of Christ Church, an online ministry where it is our mission to minister and feed the Word of God to the body of Christ. Visit our website at ubcchurch.org where we offer free full-length video and audio Bible study lessons taught verse by verse. Select a speaker, topic, or series and click filter to view the Bible lesson of your choice. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along with each verse by scrolling to the bottom of each Bible study video. If you are in need of prayer, you can visit our website and fill out the prayer request form. Please be sure to indicate if you would like your name added to our online prayer list page. And most importantly, please indicate if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We also ask that you visit the prayer list and pray for our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Last but not least, the United Body of Christ app is available in the Google Play Store and your iPhone app store. Let us now join Pastor Clarence for today's Bible study lesson. Well, God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. My name is Clarence, and I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church, which is an online ministry. On behalf of my family and myself, we like to take this opportunity to welcome your families, to welcome yourselves back to another broadcast, back to another Bible study. Today, we are coming at you with Isaiah chapter 11 and Isaiah, maybe Isaiah chapter 12. Uh, I'm really going to push to get through it. I'm so, yeah, folks, you have no idea how excited I am about this message in Isaiah chapter 11. And uh, a very powerful, a uh, very profound chapter uh, when, when we start squaring away the details of what's going on in, in chapter 11. So hold on tight. I hope you got your appetites because there's a lot of bread on the plate there to consume. Amen. And, and as always, I'm not going to try to keep it long. I'm going to try to, you know, just get to the point and keep it short and sweet and, and so on and so forth. But as always, we make room for the Holy Spirit for his commentations and, and uh, the, the revelations that he gives us throughout the broadcast. As always, we go before the Lord. Before we get started, we go before the Lord in prayer. Amen. Our Father, thou art in heaven, and hallowed be thy name. Thine kingdom comes. Thine will be done upon this earth as your will is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Father, Abba, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. We ask that you would forgive us of our transgressions. Father, forgive us of our debts. We ask that you would forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the hands of the evil one. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Eternal God, we come before you this day, having bowed down heads, having, having humbled hearts, having an appetite for the righteousness of Jesus, heart, of Jesus Christ, having thanksgiving in our hearts because of what the only begotten Son of God has done for us and on our behalf. So God, we thank you for Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you that you have made us sons and daughters of the Most High God. Jesus, we thank you for coming after us as lost and wandering sheep. Jesus, we thank you for giving access to your Father's throne room where our prayers are heard and answered. We also thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would intercede for us as you are there in heaven and allowing our names to be written down, that we would be found in your Lamb's book of life. Father, thank you for what you've done and that which you continue to do. Thank you for satisfying us, O oh God. 
filling us with the light of Jesus Christ and bestowing the righteousness of your only begotten Son unto us. Father, here we are this day seeking your face, seeking your ways, drawing nearer unto you, Father, our way of worshiping you, delighting ourselves in you by, by even taking in the word that you made possible for us to transcribe and understand. So, Father, we say thank you. Thank you for this time in our lives in which we have a desire to walk with you. We have a desire to worship you in spirit and in truth. We have a desire to please you with our faith. We have a desire to hear that pure word of God, to be strong, to come out of sin, we have a desire to be righteous and holy before you, God. And so thank you for allowing us to set our desires upon heaven, where you dwell, where your abode is. And Father, thank you for allowing us to position and condition ourselves for you to inhabit our vessels. So God, we thank you for this word that we are about to receive. We thank you for every nourishment you bestow upon not only our physical man, but our spiritual man. Every strength that you give us, every help that you give us, O oh God. Father, you show us the error of our ways, O oh God, and gives us strength to repent. You give us courage to speak to others concerning the goodness of God. You give us a testimony to share with others that compels them to try the God that is tried and true. So, Father, I say thank you for being abundant in goodness. I say thank you for being abundant in resources. You haven't hid your face or your heart from us. But you've, you've searched this world to, to make yourself known to those that are willing to receive and to have you. So, Father, I say thank you. Thank you for your power and glory. I thank you even for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. And, Father, I thank you for the ministering of your holy angels. Be glorified this day, your majesty. Pull and call the multitude out of darkness into the light of Jesus. Fill them with your spirit, your majesty, and place them around the body of Christ where all can be edified and where God could be glorified. This is our desire. I thank you for this word, this manna from heaven that has been prepared for all to receive. Your Majesty, I thank you for the courage and the understanding of the word that's about to be broadcast. I thank you, Father, for the, the truth of it, the power, the delivering power of, of, of God found in his word. Father, I thank you. I thank you so much for so many things that you do so often. Be glorified. Even in this broadcast, your majesty, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the wife of mine that you've given to help go over this word of God. I thank you even for the resources that you've allowed us to receive to help continue this, this service, this, this servitude unto thee and to put this word out for many hungry, those that are hungry for your word of truth. Father, thank you for satisfying. Thank you for filling. Thank you for delivering, your majesty. Thank you for saving. Thank you for providing, for uplifting, for giving us joy unspeakable. Thank you for allowing us to be content and even compelling us to come. Thank you for so many things that you do so often. We thank you even for this word, and it's in Jesus' name in which we pray. Amen. God is the chef, the bread that God has prepared for all of us to break and receive. It's the bread of life, the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has invited your family and yourselves, my family and myself, 
that we may come together even in the midst of this broadcast to, to sup, to share, to feast, to commune with the, uh, off the word of God and in the company one of another. My wife and I, our job is to serve what God himself has prepared for all of us to receive. That's my way of honoring the Father, and I should say that's our way here in this ministry of honoring the Father, the only begotten Son of God, and the Holy Ghost. And I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge my wife, my friend, my loving, loving wife, the daughter of God, the way that she is towards my family and myself. I'm honored and grateful and humble. Uh, that she would be my wife will be hitting in December 19 years and counting and growing and loving one another. And I bless God uh, for the opportunity to be loved and to love in returns, especially someone of her as she is. Amen. Uh, so to God be the glory forever and ever. Men may not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeded out of the mouth of God. Without any further ado, in Jesus' name, let's eat. Again, we are coming at you with Isaiah chapter 11 and quite possibly chapter 12. As we get started, before we read chapter 11 of Isaiah, I actually would like to go to uh, start out in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And I believe that what we read in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, Six, set the time frame of that which we'll read about in Isaiah chapter 11. Amen? So let's get started. If you will, go with me to Revelation chapter 20, and let's start at verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and they and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season and i saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. Look at that word, they lived and reigned. They, they governed with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath a part in the first resurrection. On such the second, the second death has no power, but they shall be priest of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So what we're looking at is that, that, that word, that, that phrase, a thousand years, it, it's saying that Christ is going to rule and govern the whole thing for a thousand years. And then it's saying that there will be those that will rule and reign with him, those that will govern with him, those whom were appointed to be and to do. And his rule would be, a, a, again, we, we, you hear this, you hear like a millennium, the term the millennium ring. And this is where we get that term from, it's the millennium ring. Now, understanding that Christ comes in to this, to this rule, and what we do know is that the enemy, the, the, the mischief maker, the the, the the chaos creator, if you will, uh, the, 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 the one that compels, the one that entices people to sin and to rebel against God. 
he is locked up now for a thousand years. So now because he is locked up and all of his cohorts, all of those that have allied with him, they've been taken out of the way just as the enemy is. Now you have this whole thousand years of peace and tranquility. As we begin to read in Isaiah chapter 11, it begins to briefly detail what that time is like as the enemy is bound and all of his allies are bound with him, if you will. It, they're either in the lake of fire, they're dead, or, or, or in this case, the enemy is bound in the pit while everybody else is cast into the lake of fire. So that's, what, that's, the, that's the backdrop here. The enemy is, is, is locked away in a pit, and then everybody else that allied with them has been cast into the, into the lake of fire. They're bound, what have you. They're taken out of the way. And so now you have this uh, a resetting of order that begins to take place because the enemy is no longer loose to cause disorder. So that's what we need to focus on. And this gives me such great joy to teach. It, 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 gives, it, it helps to reaffirm why we're hanging in and why we're holding on. It helps us to reestablish what the mark is in our lives, what we're pushing for, that prize, if you will. It's helping us to, to continue to push forth that prize because we get complacent. We get what this fight is about, what the struggle is about. Sometimes we get consumed and distracted with so many uh, strifes and offenses of this world that we tend to take our eyes off the prize and, and we fall victim to complacency. But these things help to reaffirm, to reaffirm what God has prepared for us if we just continue to hang in there and hold on. Amen? So this is Isaiah chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. There shall come forth, praise God, hallelujah, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And when we understand Jesse, if you understand your Bible study, you understand David, King David, and we know that David, that King David belonged with the tribe of Judah. And from, from Judah, from King David, come the lineage. Uh, his lineage is where Jesus Christ come from. So the scriptures acknowledge David's dad, who was Jesse. Amen? The scriptures acknowledge Jesse. And it says, from that bloodline, comes forth this branch. So if Jesse is the tree, then they're going to come forth this stem, this root out of this tree stump. And it's calling that the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's, where, that's what you're understanding about this verse here. There shall come forth a rod or a stem or, or a root, if you will, or a, 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 a sprout out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So look at Jesse as being this tree, and what comes out of this tree, this branch and this stem that, if, if the tree is Jesse, and then the branch is David, there's something that comes from that branch, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. This is powerful. We, you, you'll, hear the, you'll hear the terms, and we'll cover this, the seven spirits of God. It's the one Holy Ghost, but it, it represents seven persons of this Holy Ghost here, or seven characteristics. However you tend to look at it, it's seven portions of the Spirit that makes up the Spirit of God. And it gives you these seven, seven details about the Spirit here. The Spirit of the Lord, that's considered one. Um, the spirit of wisdom, two, the spirit of understanding, three, the spirit of counsel, four, spirit of might, five, spirit of knowledge, six, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So that represents what's in the spirit of God itself, and that is going to fall upon the Lord Jesus Christ. This is powerful. 
hold your place here. Let's go back to Revelation and look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. You have no idea uh, how excited, excited I am for us to have received this today. Look at what this says, Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. And out of the throne proceedeth lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Look at that. And it defines or details what it is. Again, if we go back to Isaiah, it's the spirit of the Lord is considered one. The spirit of wisdom is is considered two. It's the spirit of understanding, three. The spirit of counsel, four. The spirit of might, five. The spirit of knowledge, six. And the spirit of the Lord, seven. Very, very powerful. That's considered the seven spirits of God. Now, we're not stopping there. Go with me to, because it says, remember as we read in, in verse two of chapter 11 of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, right? So now, Let's look at that. Let's look, let's look at what fell upon him. Let's see that it actually, let's confirm that the Spirit of the Lord fell upon him. Go to Isaiah chapter 42 and 1. Isaiah chapter 42 and 1. Got a lot to cover here. Isaiah chapter 42 and 1. Look at what this says here. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Amen? Hold your, uh, now, let's, let's move from there and go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. So we read, again, we have read that God has placed his Holy Spirit upon uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, well, go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 9 through, through uh, 34. Chapter 29, I'm sorry. Chapter 1, verses 29. I'm getting ahead of myself. Verses 29 uh, through 34. Look at what this says here. The next day John, uh, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bared record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode on him. So as God says, in the book of Isaiah, we read that God is going to bring forth the, the rod of Jesse, okay? And that he is going to place his Spirit on him. John witnessed the Spirit of God descending on Jesus. Just as God said that, that he was going to place his Spirit, God foretold that that Jesus would have his spirit on him. John sees the event actually happening here. He, he sees it. He says, uh, and John bear record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode on him. It, it descended on him. And I knew him not but that he sent me to baptize with water. The same said to me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which shall baptize with the Holy Ghost. So he is going to release the Holy Ghost upon others. Because of him, because he received it first, he shall send the Holy Spirit upon others. Amen. That's powerful. Have that understanding. Jesus received the Spirit of God first. God foretold it that he would receive a Spirit. And then, and, and this is not that the Spirit is with him, it's that the Spirit came inside of him, if you will. Now, the Spirit comes inside of us as well. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. 
it gets real interesting here. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. John, John was told that the person that you saw receiving the Holy Ghost from heaven, he shall go forth and send the Spirit to fall upon others. Peter testified to that in the book of Acts when he said, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, here is one of the most powerful things about it. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of the Lord himself, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. All that is in you now. When the Holy Ghost falls on you, it's, it, how, you think you just woke up one morning and you, you, just, you have this reverence, this fear of the Lord? It's because you receive his Holy Spirit. You think you wake up one morning and things start to click? You start to have understanding about things that you wasn't familiar with before? It's because the Spirit is inside of you doing what it did in Jesus Christ. It gives you understanding to the workings of the kingdom of God. When you were carnal, when you were carnally in this world, you did stuff like a da dun da dun. I hear my wife, my wife used to say that all the time. You, you, you don't be a da dun da dun, right? So you did things according to your ignorance. You did stuff carnally. You did things foolishly, foolishly because you didn't have understanding. But once you get the spirit of the Lord inside of you. All of a sudden, there is a wisdom to the way you go about doing things. The things of God no longer seem foolish to you. All of a sudden, you start to receive stuff. Stuff that you used to laugh at back in the day, now you're just eating it up today. You can't seem to get enough of it. It's because God puts his spirit in you, and it gives you an appetite of heavenly things. It gives you an appetite to please the Lord. And then not only does it give you an appetite, it gives you insight to the workings of the kingdom of God. It's because of his spirit being inside of us. That's how that operates. So when you hear, when we're, when we're back in Isaiah chapter 11, verse two, reading about what, what comprises the Holy Ghost, and you read about this understanding, those things that are in the Holy Ghost are now in you because the Holy Ghost dwells inside of you. Do you understand? And that is a glorious thing. And that is the, the direct result and benefit of Jesus having to come forth because God had a new plan for the whole earth. And, and his plan kicked off when Jesus became this lamb of God. Remember when John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. That was the plan of God. And once Jesus ascended into heaven, it was no sooner after that that the Holy Ghost descended upon the disciples, allowing us to be partakers of what was laid up for Jesus Christ. So when you have, again, when you have this wisdom, you begin to operate according to wisdom. You know that when you start to do things, there'll be a voice inside of you saying, don't do that. Don't say that. Don't look at that. Don't turn there. Don't go there. Just, just, you know, just thank God. Don't just, don't bother with it. Just let it be. That voice of reasoning, this, 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 the spirit of wisdom is inside of you and operating, you know, trying to, trying to keep you sealed until Jesus comes to break the seal. It's just, it is, this is what we've been fighting for. This is what we're waiting. This is what we're waiting on. This is the reaffirmation of, of, of what we're coming into, that prize uh, uh, that's ahead of us, and we're, we're, we're reinvigorated to keep marching forward to pursue that prize. And this is what this is, but it gets better than this. What, what do the announcers say on TV? Wait, there's more. So again, to, to, just, to just reiterate, what Jesus received and John bear witness to the spirit falling on Jesus Christ we also get it. And, and you'll understand that when you come into knowledge and understanding, 
you know, you, you, why you're coming into that concerning the kingdom of God, concerning the workings of the father. You know, when you come into knowledge and understanding, when you have a reverence and a fear for him, it's because of the spirit of the Lord inside of you. All of that apprises the, the, the spirit of the Lord. The, the seven spirits of God represents that one spirit, the Holy Spirit. The, the, the Holy Spirit being first and foremost, the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, might, counsel, fear of the Lord. You know, all of those things represent that. And that operates inside of you because it operated inside of Jesus Christ. It is, it's wonderful. I, I, let me get out of the way because wait, there's more. So <laughs> get out of the way. Verse three, watch. And shall make him quick of understanding in the fear of the Lord, and shall not judge after the sight of the eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of ears. So, if somebody, one of the things that my family and I try to do is operate off of two sides of a story. There's always two sides of a story. And, and when you hear one side, you have an incomplete story. The world operates off of one side of the story, General, generally, you know, just generally. They operate off of one side of the story. And when Christ comes, Christ is not looking towards who's right and who's wrong based on the world standard. He's doing things off of the kingdom standard. And based off of the kingdom, just because the world says that you were wrong, the kingdom would uphold you as being right. Remember, remember the parable of, of, of the two that went to pray and there was a Pharisee and a tax collector. Okay, go with me to Luke chapter 18 and let's look at verses 9 through 14. Luke chapter 18 verses 9 through 14. I think this will... Uh, Instead of me trying to recall it by memory, I just as soon as read it to give you at least a reference point of it. So what did I say? Luke 18 verses 9 through 14. Look at this. Look at this. This is interesting. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a, a publican, in this case a tax collector. Publican is a tax collector. Tax collectors were despised because they oppressed the people. When the, when the Romans came in, the, one of the one things that the Romans wanted to establish was to make the Jews pay tribute or pay taxes, right? So they were all taxed. So, they, so tax collectors were despised, okay? So one was a Pharisee, and one was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not, that I'm not as others or even as this tax collector or publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And, and the publican or the tax collector standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. He was ashamed. But he beat upon his chest or his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. This is the eyes in which Jesus sees through. This is the standard in which the kingdom of God operates at. The, the world would say that that, that that Pharisee, which is a religious leader, thought that he was better than the tax collector. And by the standards of the world, everybody would have agreed, would have agreed with them. But God didn't see things in that manner. The, the fact that the other one was ashamed of his occupation and what he did and asked God to be merciful and forgiving of him because of what he's done. God said that that person was more uh, justified than the other one that bragged about how he was and all that he's done. This is in which, this is that which the, the book of Isaiah speaks about. 
the, the eyes that Jesus sees through, the judgment that comes out of heaven that passes through Jesus Christ. That's an example of that, of that kind of discernment that he has. That, that, that kind of authority, that, that judgment that he has, that, that kingdom standard that Jesus had that he judges matters with. That's an example of that. Amen. A powerful example, might I add. So he says, but with, so rereading verse three, he shall make him quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. So he, he's, he knows that there is two sides of a story. And just because the world agrees one way don't mean that Jesus need to follow their agreement. He's doing things according to the standard, he, to the standard of the kingdom, right? Verse four, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity the meek of the earth and shall smite with the earth uh, shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Very, very, very powerful. That shows the kind of authority that he has, that he is a righteous king and leader. Verse 5, righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his, of his uh, uh, um, rings. So he'll wear righteousness like a belt, and truth like an undergarment. That's He's not going to be a corrupted politician. <laughs> Neither Democrat nor Republican. He is not going to be corrupt. He, he, you can't buy him off. You can't bribe him. He is not going to be biased towards corporations, if you will. He's not like that. He has a kingdom mindset, a kingdom standard about himself and that's how he wants us to be not looking at not looking at left versus right black versus white uh you know uh, democrat versus versus republican not looking at at you know progressive versus whatever the opposite is he's not getting caught up in those things there is a kingdom standard that's been set in heaven that abides in Jesus and that he executes here on this earth. And as a nation of priests, uh, uh, which we are as believers, he wants us to operate in the same manner, not according to what we see with the eyes, but what we discern from our spirit. That's the way we ought to be. Mercy to whom mercy is due. Amen. That's who we ought to be. That's the way we ought to be. Those are the standards in which we live by. And that's what he executes as the king of kings, the prince of all the kings of the earth. Amen. The righteousness shall be right and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. So we read that again. That's saying that he is going to wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. Now, remember, as we read, um, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, we, we, we opened up the lesson with that. And remember what we talked about, how it detailed his millennium reign. So when we read verses 1 through 5 in chapter 11 of Isaiah, it's talking about the character of the leader that's going to come forth. Now it begins to talk about how the time will be when he arrives and he begins to rule. Look at what this says. Remember in, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, once the enemy is locked up, it talked about Jesus ruling and reigning for a thousand years and those that would reign with him for a thousand years, those that would govern with him for a thousand years. Now, this is going to, verses uh, uh, 6, at least through the rest of the chapter, is going to talk about what happens during this thousand year rule, okay? This thousand year reign. So this is very phenomenal. Verse six, the wolf also, also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A little child shall lead them. Notice that the 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 animal the animal kingdom is compelled. They're 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 
they're transformed in this thousand year rule of Jesus Christ that there is no longer this bloodshed of the animal kingdom their diets have changed the, they don't look at other animals as a meal they look at other animals in a spirit of fellowship that they're getting along right I mean look at it the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. That was supper. The, the, the wolf looked at the lamb as a meal. It was supper time, right? And the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the little calf. It's not, it's not looking to eat, to hurt, to maim, to harm. It's looking for camaraderie, for fellowship. And this is some of the power of the kingdom of God. What happens is Jesus restores the order when things were placed in disorder at the beginning, going back to Adam and Eve. When God created Adam, he gave him dominion over the world. And there was no reason that Adam should have been afraid of the animals of the world because there was a level of peace. But when Eve bit into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not only did they sin, but they allowed the, the understanding of carnality to come into the world of fierceness, ferociousness, of murder, you know, of death, of violence. Once you release the knowledge of good and evil in the world that was contained in the garden, and now when she bit the apple, it, it like it released all this information into the world. There was a data breach, if you look at it that way. And now everybody, all of everybody under the sin, under under this the, the, the seduction of sin, and now the, the information has been released about bloodshed, and now there's that there's an appetite of bloodshed after this data breach, if you will, that took place in the Garden of Eden. And 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 the enemy uses this data breach to make everything in disorder. Right? So now he's locked up. And now things are placed back in order. This is why man was meant to be able to walk amongst the animals and not fear for his life, right? He didn't need a weapon in his hand because the order that God had set at the beginning gets reestablished when Jesus comes forth. This is why we keep our eyes on the prize. This is why we keep moving regardless of what we're going through, the, the heartaches, the pains, the trials and tribulations that we have to suffer through, it all it's all worth it in the end, right? So the book begins to detail what that end is like for us. Look at this. So again, in God's plan, in God's plan of restoration through Jesus Christ, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall dwell with the with the calf, the small calf, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. They won't have to worry about the, the lion killing the kid and, and 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 the animals the bloodshed right you don't have to worry about that and the cow and the bear shall feed their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like an ox you know and, like the ox and their diet begins to change they're no longer carnivores they're no longer meat eaters right <laughs> they go back to to uh, a vegetation appetite, right? It is, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's exciting and amazing. Let's, let's continue because this is what happens during this thousand year reign that we read about uh, after the enemy is locked up because he can no longer cause confusion and disorder, right? So verse 8, the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp. So uh, a child that's small is able to the child that's still providing uh, 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 milk from his mama's, his mom's paps, that child is able to wander off amongst the animals and be well taken care of and not have to worry. Neither will the mother have to worry about anything, right? It's saying what kind of time. It's, 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 it's defining in detail the kind of time that we're living in, that we will live in when this time comes, that you won't, it's, it's, it's really exercising, uh, uh, um, it's really detailing figuratively uh, uh, about the level of peace that's going to consume the world, right? And look what, I'm, what it goes on to say. So the sucking child shall play on the hole of an asp. And when you look at this, what the hole of an asp is, that asp is a cobra, 
It's, 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 it's a cobra. It's a snake. He can, he, can play in the sna he can play in the hole of a snake. And the winged child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. And when you look at that cockatrice, it's, it's like a viper, if you will. So basically, a baby that's still nursing from his mom can put his hand in the hole of the earth where the snakes and the cobras and the vipers dwell and not have to worry about getting bit, right? The animals, the mother won't have to worry. The, time, the peace will be so compelling that, figuratively speaking, you won't have to worry about a child wandering off and being harmed by the animals of the world because peace will have been re restored. The utopia that God had created at the beginning that man forfeited over sin because of sin, it gets restored. Right. And, and it's powerful. I'll continue to read because this this gets heavy. Verse nine. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters over the sea. And nowadays, the, the knowledge of the Lord is suppressed. You can't suppress it when the time comes. No more Google suppressing information, Twitter suppressing information, uh, uh, the publications of the world suppressing information. When it comes to the kingdom of God, there's no longer any confusion, there's no longer any suppression, and there's no protesting over it. That, that There's no longer a discussion of, of, of the separation of church and state. You don't have that. Everything is church. <laughs> Everything is church. Everything is worship now. <laughs> the state becomes secondary. It's, it's, the state is ruled by the church. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. You no longer have, uh, 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 what, what is that, what is that, that the uh, AC, the AC, or what is that, uh, the, the, the 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 group of uh, lawyers that 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 defends the ACL that defends civil liberties, you know, the, you no longer have the infringement upon. So you no longer need the ACL to defend you, right? Because they your civil your civil liberties were infringed upon. People taking you to court because you want to stand on your faith. You don't want to bake cake for for for. For those who openly rebel against the Lord, you don't want to, you know, you want to be able to pray in public. You want to be able to pray on a football field, right? You don't want to, you know, be be accused of of provoking others to come on out on a football field and pray with you, right? You don't want you're not you're not hemmed up on trumped up charges, right? It's no longer about that. There is no longer a suppression. Uh, of, of of information concerning the kingdom of the of the Lord and 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 uh, of the of his righteousness that of Jesus Christ and all of all of his disciples his believers his followers there's no longer you're no longer you rule now the, the there is a shift that the meek has now inherited the earth <laughs> and it's wonderful it, um, it makes you excited because you know you there, you no longer need a CNN and, and a Fox News and 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 Newsmax. You don't long, you no longer need these things, right? Because there is no news to report. You know how they say good news don't really make the news, right? There's always something tragic. Well, there's nothing but good news, so they're all out of business. <laughs> They're all, they're, they're all out of business. There's, there's no way for them to, to cope. Every, everything is, is goodness, right? It's exciting. And you can, the, the best thing about it, you can't suppress any information. None of the information about Christ or his rule is suppressed. Nowadays, men suppress it. They try to hide it. Hold your place there. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. And let's take a look at uh, 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 verses 18 through 25. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This shows you what men tries to do, what men will try to do when they when, when they get a hold of the information of the Lord, and they don't want to they don't want to comply with it, 
when they come into God's truth and they don't want to comply with it. Not only do they try to bury it, but they try to keep it from anybody else. Look at what this says, Romans chapter 1 beginning at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So they'll take they'll take the truth and they suppress it. They'll try to hide it. You know, however they doing it nowadays, Google or anything else that they're trying to they're trying to hide it. So it says they hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, they suppress the truth. They don't want it known. They try to hide it because they don't want, not only do they not want to comply with God's truth, but they don't want you to know it either, lest you rebel and, and walk in liberty. They, they want, it's like the enemy knows that he only has so much time, so he's going out here, you know, moving everybody else to join him in the lake of fire when the time comes. Well, that's what men are doing. Men, when they, they find out that God is real and what is truth, how, it, how you're empowered by God's truth, and they don't wanna, they wanna rebel and they don't wanna comply. Well, not only do they don't want it, but they don't want you to have it either, right? So they try to pull it out of range so that you can't get it. Because that which, was, which, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God have showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I don't care how they call themselves an atheist. What they've done is they've taken God's truth and tried to suppress it. They've tried to hide it so that they're not, they, they think that if, if, if I don't receive it, if if I refuse it, and if I don't even buy into it, then I can't be charged accountable to it, okay? Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Because they didn't want to know him, they didn't want to have anything to do with him, and they wanted to keep anybody else from knowing him or knowing his truth. Their heart became darkened. That's the bottom line. They became reprobates. They profess, and the result of that was them professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed, four-footed beasts and creeping things. God said that you shall have, you shall have no, you should not worship him. No image or anything that, that you would use to worship him in. You know, you should have no images to make him into that. Well, they didn't want to acknowledge him, so they decided to acknowledge a, 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 a figure of an owl or, or some kind of leopard and then say that they, they call that their God and what have you. They, 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 they refused God, and then they came up with their own God, and they, God said they look foolish doing so, right? Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up, they become reprobate. When it's, that's the worst thing God can do is give you up to yourself, okay? Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to, be dishon to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And this is why the main thing you see, people that are reprobate, people that have been turned over to themselves, and what that means is you, don't, you no longer have a conscience about what you do to yourself or what you do to others. You no longer have that conscience, okay? And when that happens, the sky is the limit when it comes to, to an offense. You know, it's sexual, and, and the, one of the main examples of a person or one of the main signs or, or, or evidence that a person is turned over is, is turned over to themselves is when you see sexual uh, immorality take place within them. A sexual immorality okay when they begin to dishonor not only their own bodies but the bodies of others right sexual exploitations you know ex experiments you know this it's, it's it just goes on right verse 25 who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who was blessed forever amen so the reason why we read that is because it showed how men suppress stuff because they didn't want to acknowledge God. 
Well, when it comes to the millennium rule of Christ, you can no longer suppress anything. It's just open. It's an open market of truth. And that's what you read here in the verse where in verse nine, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. You can no longer suppress it. That's why we, we read what happens when you suppress the, 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 the knowledge of God. Here, the knowledge of God is open, and so you see the power of God permeate even in the midst of peace. Okay, Verse 10, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand as a banner of the people, to which shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glory. So he's going to, so when Jess, the root of Jesse shall come forth, it's talking about David's dad, out of David's dad shall come forth the Lord Jesus Christ, and his kingdom will be not only there for the Jews, but the Gentiles, us, those that are not Jewish. <laughs> his, his kingdom will be for us too, right? And it, it's going to be a banner. It'll be a kingdom for us, right? Oh, man. And look, it says, and his rest shall be glorious. His kingdom, his rule shall be a glorious rule. His reign shall be glorious. It's talking about what's happening when the enemy is out of place, when the enemy is locked up, <laughs> when there is no longer any adversaries of the Lord our God, right? It's, it's grand. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, from, and from the Isles of the Sea, from the rest of the world. So even though there's a, a, an Israeli state right now in Israel where the Jews are, are stationed, you don't, still there's Jews which remain all over the world. But when the millennium kingdom comes, they will all be compelled to join Christ where he is. Amen. And they will come from all over the world and, and be stationed right there. That's just wonderful. And he shall set up a, a, a banner for the nations and show that ensign is an, a banner for the nations as, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And again, remember we talked about that the when it talks about the outcast, uh, imagine the, the the people that are looked down, and we have a, a a society of class, right? You have the 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 rich, the upper 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 class, and then you have the middle class, and you have the lower class, and you have those that 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 you don't in in our classes of society, you know. Uh, people don't have want to have the upper class don't want to have nothing to do with those of lower class society. You know, God is not like that. God is he's not like that, and and therefore Jesus is not like that. And the, the those that were considered uh, that society considers bottom feeders, they will be the ones that are lifted up. They will be the ones that are lifted up. So people may, in the upper class, they may have their, their glory now, if you will, if I can even use that word. They may have their prestige now, which may be a better word to use, their honor amongst men right now. But the time will come where the meek shall inherit the earth. Amen. They, they're going to be the ones that, that are brought forth in society. Amen. And recognized. Rather than rather than discounted, amen. What a time! It's 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 major. What a time! So verse twelve. Oh well, let me let me reread let me reread verse twelve. So he shall set up a banner for the nations, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel, and shall gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart. The adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. What caused the civil, the civil war between the northern tribe and the southern tribe, 
you had the 10 tribes of, remember there's 12 tribes of Israel, the 10 tribes to the north uh, and the two remaining tribes to the south. That which caused them to divide will no longer be an issue. They'll be brought back together. Reconciliation takes place. The enemy is out of the way. No more mischief, no more confusion, no more provocation, no more wars. The enemy is out of the way. His allies are destroyed. And now people of peace remains and they come together. You can't even remember why you were broken apart in the first place, right? And that's this time when Christ comes, there is, when Christ begins to rule, there is a reconciliation. Remember, we started out reading Revelation 1 through, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, that, that Christ will rule for a thousand years and the enemy will be locked up for a thousand years. And it's detailing what, how that time is going to be, the expectation that happens within that time, okay? Going on with this, but they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hands upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall his hand, uh, uh, shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it in the seven streams, and make, and and make men go over dry, dry, uh, dry shot. And I believe what I, I actually believe what this is saying here is that when he first comes. He comes on this cloud and we meet him in the air. And I believe that when he comes, the first thing that he does is rid the earth of the enemies of God. And he, this is his way of setting things back in order. I believe that as we read verses 6 through 13, it talks about what happens uh, after uh, I believe the events that we read in verses 14 through 16 takes place first. And then after that, you read uh, uh, verses 6 through 13 talks about this utopia. So I believe, again, as we read verses 14 going to the close of the chapter, verses 16, 14 through 16, this that happens, it rids the earth of the enemies of God, which are the enemies of the, of the Jews, right? It rids the earth of them. And, 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 and gets them, and those that will, gets them to comply, right? And, and remember, the scripture said, vengeance is of the Lord. So those that came against Israel, God brings Israel together to get rid of these people, right? And then after that happens, you have this utopia. So I believe that's the order of things. So we read in 14, but they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, and they shall spoil them as the east as of the east together and they shall lay their hands upon Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon and obey them and sh the children of Ammon shall obey them. The Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea with this mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shot just as they did when the Egyptians first came after the children of Israel after they left and they went through the Red Sea and the and the Lord had Moses, the, the Lord through Moses uh, uh, divided the sea and allowed the children of Israel to go over dry land in the midst of the sea. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria like it was uh, like it was to Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt of Egypt. So the Lord is going to part the sea and allow wherever his children are to travel on the dry land after the sea is departed to come back to uh, to come back to Israel, and it's it's just a mighty and a glorious thing to see. So I'm really excited about that. Hopefully, you understood everything that was going on there that the scriptures is telling us. Now, now let's we'll quickly go through chapter 12. I wanted to try to get through chapter 12, and I I, I really would like to cover it um, before we read chapter 12. I want to go to Romans 
uh, uh, chapter 11, verses 11 through 15. R Romans chapter 11, verses 11 through 15. And I'll try to be quick here. Romans chapter 11, verses 11 through 15. I say then, have they stumbled that they should that they should fall? God forbid. And it's talking about Israel, and it's given it's 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 a the a, a Paul. Paul begins to to talk about um, what has happened to Israel and how we as Gentiles get a chance to benefit from what's happened to Israel. Look at what he says here again. Romans chapter eleven, verse eleven. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now if, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentile, how much more their fullness, right? For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles and I, magnif I magnify mine office. If I by any means, if by any means I provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall we, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So we wanted to read that before we read these uh, six verses in 12. Now look at what this says beginning of uh, Isaiah chapter 12 verse 1. And in that day, thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou was angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. God sent, God allowed the children of Israel to be scattered because their heart was so hardened against them and they were full of rebellion. And so he blinded them. And allowed them, he blinded them because their hearts was hard, their heart was hardening. So he blinded them. In their blindness, and when I say blindness, I'm, speak, I'm figuratively speaking that he allowed a hardened heart for them not to see and receive Jesus Christ because the heart was hardened. And so while they was busy arguing because they were blinded through the hardened heart, the Gentiles were able to receive Jesus as Lord. And, and, and that provoked Israel to jealousy. Once the fullness of the Gentiles come in, God takes the scales off the eyes of Israel for them to see that he is the Messiah. And then God saves them. He begins to save them. And now we're starting to see the scales are starting to, because their hearts are softening, a lot of this, the scales are falling off the eyes of Israel. Hence is what we see this verse here in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 12. In that day thou shalt say, this is what the Jews will say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Thou was angry with me. Thine anger was turned away, and thou comfortest me. God begins to turn away his anger. And in doing so, they accept Jesus as Lord and are brought into the fold. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Their heart and heart didn't say that before. But now because they've been humbled and in this time that God brings them all together they begin to rejoice because they've accepted Jesus as Lord and they accepted the plan of God for their own lives. Amen? Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation, and in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he has done excellent things that is known in all of the earth. Even the Gentiles know. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. So that's going to conclude 
our Bible study, our lesson for the day. Eternal God, I thank you for such a powerful word, a word of understanding and a word of jubilation, a word of promises that, that shall be fulfilled, that the plan of God is already moving towards the fulfillment of all the things that have been specified, even in today's lesson. I pray, Your Majesty, that you will glorify and I thank you for giving us a word to give to the people, even the word that you've already prepared for us to have and to receive. Now we pray that many will, that have heard this word will be as excited and will be compelled to continue moving forward in you. That, that their vision will be adjusted, Father, that they can see the heavenly things and desire the treasure thing, the treasures which are laid up in heaven. I pray for those that are called out of darkness that they will receive Jesus as Lord and come into his light and that they are equipped to continue with us and that they will never fall back into this world, even the world of darkness. Father, we thank you for such a powerful word. We thank you for the coming king, the king of kings, the Lord of Lord, the prince of all the kings of the earth. Father, we are so excited for his rule and his reign. And we thank you for, because of you, it shall be so. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Quickly, quickly, quickly go with me to Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest his kingdom will be known of rest a time of peace and he prepares us by conditioning us to appreciate the rest that we will have today amen um i come from a job uh my former career uh i, I worked six days a week at that job there was a time that uh, early in my career that I was doing seven days a week. There was times that I did seven, but six was a general, um, a general week of work for me. And I remember telling God that I was tired, you know, and, but I thanked him for the strength that I had to, to continue to be able to work it. And our debt was so that I had to be, I felt like I needed to be six days a week. I end up having a change of career and now the career that I currently have, um, they try to get us to work six days a week. As a matter of fact, when I first started the company, uh, because I, I was over the road a lot, I actually worked six days a week and I didn't want to work six days a week. And I told God again, I was tired. Um, the Lord allowed us to move towards getting our debt off the books, the debt that we had accumulated or the debt, I should say, that I had accumulated. He allowed us to, to move some of it off the books, if you will. And I, I asked him, Lord, I, I, I don't want to work six days. Now the Lord has placed us into position that I'm five days a week. Sometimes I'm four days a week, depending on how things go at my company for the week. Sometimes I'm four days a week. But there is a time of that I get this rest. And I look, I can't wait for the week to be over, my work week to be over, so I can come into that rest. And I love it. That family time that I have, um, if I'm just working around my house, you know, um, maybe cutting the grass or whatever. I delight in those things. I'm serious. I delight in that. I'm at home in a place of solitude. I'm not distracted or confounded by the things that are happening outside of my address. I enjoy being home and resting with the family. I, I, I absolutely, it's absolutely wonderful for me. This is what Jesus does. He gives you this portion of rest that you use that you would otherwise take for granted. And you begin to praise him for it. You begin to desire it. You begin to long for it. And he starts to give it to you. 
And once he starts giving it to you, you start fighting for it. You start putting things on that on the scale and those things don't don't compare any longer. You looked at the extra money that it would take to run your house or to to finance your desires. And you knew that you would have to forfeit your, your rest to get those things. But your desires were so that it was OK to, to forsake the rest that, that God wanted to give you. And you would go and pursue those things and pursue those things and, and you'll end up getting more. And the more you got, the more you wanted. And you will constantly forsake your rest. But when you belong to God, through Jesus Christ, God begins to be like, you, you don't understand the true gift that I'm giving you. I'm giving you rest through my son. And I want you to... Just trust me for a moment to try this rest that I want to give you. And I began to, to take, him on a, uh, take him up on this offer. And he, he began to knock my feet. He began to knock my, my feet, my shoes off my feet with, with his idea of rest. And I'm telling you what, I can't wait to get, boy, when Friday come, to, to be able to get home. And oh, my goodness, I love it. That's a snippet of what he has in store for us. That rest that, I, that I'm eager to get. Today is Sunday. I start work Monday. Once I go to bed tonight, it's a full-on press to get to the end of the week so that I can get back to, to my enjoyment of rest again. That's a snippet of what he's offering. Do you understand? That's a snippet. And if that little... Is doing so much to me when, when it comes to my marriage, when it comes to my health, when it comes to my enjoyment of life. If that little is doing that much for me, imagine when this full on rest comes. Forget about it. <laughs> right? Forget about it. I mean, it's like that. That's what I'm excited about. That's what he is trying to give us. That's what he is trying to reprogram us to, to take him up on his offer at. Because uh, the enemy, what God is trying to offer you through Jesus Christ, the enemy is trying to offer you some things too. And his may be shiny and, and, and electronic-y and, 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 you know, it's got all these special features and stuff. God's rest is real simple. It's, 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 it's not as shiny as something may, you know, based on... The world standard, it don't appear to be as shiny, you know. And then when you look at family time, you, the family is so broken up that who wants to spend time with a broke up family? This is what the havoc that the enemy creates to the point that nobody even wants to be home because you can't stand one another. You want to be gone away and out living and partying and all that until you're drained because you don't know what real peace is. That real peace is on the path to what real joy is. And if you can't rest, when if you can't rest, you can't get that peace, you can't get that joy. You got to have rest to appreciate all that God has to offer. And when you can see the value of rest, you begin to see the value of peace. When you see the value of peace, you begin to experience joy. But it starts with this, this rest that he wants to give you. Amen. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for my my. He said and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So that's my testimony to you. This is why he's offering it to you, because you have no idea how consumed and wore out you are because because of what the world constantly offers and how it puts you in bondage to where you you feel compelled. I can't survive if I'm not doing six and seven days. I can't survive. Those weeks that I only have four days a week, oh, man. <laughs> um, oh, my goodness, man. I, I'll be enjoying it. I'll be loving it. So, um, but. I bless God because he gives us that understanding of what true rest is. So the son is saying, let me be Lord over your life. 
let me redefine what real value is in your life. Take a chance on me. Trust me. Trust in me. And let me show you and let me give you what my Father in heaven has to offer. And if you're willing to try it his way, if you're willing to have value reassessed in your life in a godly manner, if you're willing to turn away from your sins and be holy and, and make yourself a living sacrifice unto God for him to, to have to for him to come into your body through his Holy Spirit and just live through you and guide you through his spirit because of his only begotten son, then welcome aboard. Look at what this says. This is Romans chapter 10. Let's begin at verse 9. Romans 10 beginning at verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Let's answer the question of what are you being saved from. If you will kindly go with me to the Gospel of John chapter 3 and let's take a look at verse 36. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's what you're being saved from. Remember we talked about that in the millennium ring that the enemy will be locked up for a thousand years and his allies and his cohorts, they'll be destroyed lake of fire, so on and so forth. That's what's happening here. All of those that rebelled against Jesus Christ, that rebelled against God's way of doing things, that, that rejected Jesus, those are the ones that God's wrath fall on. Those are the ones that are not present in the millennium ring. In the, in the millennium ring. You don't want to be counted amongst them. You want to be counted amongst those that accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior. Whatever hangups you have that you say, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. He's, all he's asking you to do is to give him a chance. That's what he's asking you to do, to give him a chance. And he's long suffering because he knows you didn't get this way overnight. How rebellious you have been those sinful appetites that you have, those things that you need repentance of. He knows that you didn't get that way overnight, but he's not making it about you. He's making it about him. And he's saying that just give him a chance because he wants to give you a chance. That's all this. That's how this thing is. Begin to obey him. Make him Lord of your life. Follow him. Follow his teachings. Observe them and do them. And let him begin to change you immediately. Your full change won't happen instantaneously or overnight. But the work starts immediate. And it, the work, you come into this faith and this grace by the way that you believe. You believe that Jesus was the only begotten son of God and that he became a lamb of God for us all, meaning that he laid down his life that there may be the shedding of his blood. And it's by his blood that we are washed and cleansed of all of our sins. Amen. And in order for, in order for you to be saved from the wrath of God, you have to allow him to be Lord over your life. And once you allow him to be Lord over your life, it's his blood that was shed on the cross that's still powerful today that cleanses you of all of your sins. But in order for that blood to wash you, you have to accept Jesus as Lord of your life. Amen? He goes on to say, uh, goes on to say here that for the for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I believe in my heart that Jesus is the only begotten son of God and I confess with my mouth that he is Lord of my life. 
He is the only begotten Son of God, and He is my Lord. Those are the things that I confess. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. So if you take a chance on Him, He won't let you down. For there is no difference between the Jews and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich upon all that call upon Him. So the way He loved the Jews and the way He saved the Jews is the way that he wants to save us, the Gentiles. Remember where it says, and his kingdom or his ensign or his banners shall the Gentiles seek. So we're also going to seek him and he'll be made found of us. He'll be found of us. He makes himself available for us to find him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it don't mean that you need to be Jewish to call upon him as a Gentile. Call upon the name of the Lord and ask him to save you from your sins. Your part is to repent and call. You'll repent and call. He'll answer and make and, and, and save you. He'll answer and save you. Amen. Now, go with me to Acts chapter, not Acts. Go with me to 1 John uh, chapter 8. I'm sorry. Let me get this together. 1 John Chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. 1 John, chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. Look at what this says. If we say that we have not sinned, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So when, when I talk to you about repentance, about turning away from your sins, what I'm asking you to do is to be honest with yourself about what's broken about you. Because those are the things that's going to hinder you from getting the fullness of your walk and your relationship with God. Those are the things that are going to stifle and stagnate you. Those are the things that you have to turn over and get rid of. So if you say that, well, there is nothing broken about me, then you're not being honest about what is broken about you. And you won't be allowed to get this fullness that God is looking for you to have, this deliverance that God is looking to bestow upon you. So you have to be honest about what's going on with you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of, of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we repent and confess, he forgives and cleanses. If we repent and confess, he forgives and cleanses. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. He can't help us if we're not honest about what's going on. Lastly, go with me to Acts chapter 2 and we'll quickly go through uh, verses 36 through 47. Look at what, what uh, Peter says here in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God had made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Earlier in our lesson, we talked about the spirit of God uh, uh, falling on Jesus Christ uh, and John bearing witness to it. And then eventually the spirit of God falls upon the disciples and then after the, after the disciples receive God's spirit, we receive the spirit. And this event happens when we're reading in Acts chapter 2 and we're reading in verse 36. The spirit of God had just fell upon the disciples and came inside of them. So now afterwards, Peter began to minister to those that were present on this high day or this holy day of the Jews, which this particular one was called Pentecost. So Peter begins to minister after he received the indwelling of the Spirit of God. He ministers to all the other people that were there outside of the Jew, outside of the uh, disciples of Jesus Christ. And Peter begins to talk to them and tell them that you may not have been the one to drive the nails through his hands. You may not have been the one to crucify Jesus, but your rejection of him, your rebellion against him, make you just as guilty as those that did crucify him. That applies to us as well. Our lifestyles make us just as guilty as those that had nailed him to the cross. We're no better than them. And so we can change from that, but we first have to admit that we need to change. 
And here are, in verse 37, we find those that received the truth and wanted to change. Look at what 37 says. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They wanted to know what can they do to change. Peter tells them in verse 38, repent, turn away from all of your sins once and for all, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, let's briefly talk about baptism. We know that Christ laid down his life on the cross. He was taken down off the cross and he was laid to rest in a tomb. For three days and three nights, he was laid to rest or he was dead. After three days and three nights, God brought him back to life. When we go through the ceremony of baptism, when we lay down in the water being fully submerged, we are buried in Jesus Christ. When we come up out of the water after having been fully submerged, we are resurrected in Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus was laid to rest three days and three nights, and then he was brought back to life. In this case, he was buried and he was resurrected. When you go down into the water, you're being buried in Jesus. When you come up out of the water, you're being resurrected in Jesus Christ. Your old man goes down, your new man comes up, all of your sins are washed away. Remember when we read in, in uh, uh, 1 John uh, verse, verse 9 where it says God is uh, faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness? That's part of the cleansing process, that the waters of baptism. So you want to make sure you get that done. Ask God to send to send you somewhere to have the ceremony performed or to send someone to you to perform the ceremony. But you definitely want to get it done. Look at the rest of this verse here in, in 38. So he says, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What Jesus received, what, what John the Baptist saw descending upon Jesus Christ what the disciples have received, we also receive it as well. Amen? And, and that's a promise from God. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this godless or lawless or perverse crooked generation. <laughs> many adjectives that you could put there. Separate yourselves from those that are against the Lord our God. What fellowship should you have with them? If you're not ministering the gospel to them and they, are continue, they continue to rebel against him, you don't want to be guilty by association, right? Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. Whatever God has done to get you to the point when you are now productive, you have rest, you have peace, you have joy, stay the course. Don't start, because you've had a bad day, don't stop moving forward and then all of a sudden you're standing still. Once you stand still, you're in danger of falling back, which is backsliding. Even if you've had a bad day, even if you dropped the ball, keep moving forward. Don't stop praying. Don't stop asking for forgiveness. Repent. Ask God for strength. Keep moving forward. That's what they were doing. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking bread, and in prayers. Continue to pray. Continue to move forward. Don't stop. I don't care how difficult it gets. Keep moving forward, you will have a breakthrough. Fear came upon every soul. Remember that that's the Spirit of God falls on them. Once you get the, that fear of the Lord, that's, 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 the Spirit. that's the Spirit of God working inside of you. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. They could not do anything unless they had the Spirit in them, right? And all, they that, all that believed were together and had all things common, and they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily, there's that word, continue, 
with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they did eat their food or their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Eternal God, we just take this opportunity to say thank you for the gift of salvation that operates through our faith. Faith is that which you have gifted us with as well. The best gift of all is the gift of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is through him, even by this faith of Abraham, that we have salvation and eternal life. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for calling us out of darkness and bringing us into the light of Jesus Christ. Now, your majesty, Father, Abba, we pray for others that have come out of darkness and come into the light of Christ, those who now have access to the kingdom of God. And we pray that we, you would fill them with your spirit, that they would do signs and wonders, that their purpose would be established, that they may glorify you, that they may magnify Jesus and edify our brethren. Send them to places of worship where they can serve. Give them a spirit of servitude. Fill them with your spirit and lead them even to the waters of baptism. Father, I thank you for adding to the size of our family. And I thank you for the kingdom of God which is at hand. To God be the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Bible study. I thank you for your prayers and your proceeds, uh, for your support of this ministry. It means so much. And, and I, I really thank you for helping us and being mindful of us. Amen. Uh, I, as always, our benediction comes from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. Repent of all of your sin, of all of your sins. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent of your sins. Amen. Don't let these blessings be forfeited because of any unrepentant sin. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I loose this on you that ye shall receive it, that you would prosper because of it, and that you would bless God for being mindful of you always through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be grateful, be prosperous. Let your heart be filled with thanksgiving and let doors be open so that God can help walk you through them in Jesus' name. And Father, it's said in your word through Jesus Christ that whatsoever we loose here on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And whatsoever thing we bind here on earth shall be bound in heaven. Therefore, we loose these blessings that they are loosed in the kingdom of God and that men shall prosper, those that believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Father. Amen. Again, folks, thank you. God bless you. We look forward to our next broadcast and our next recording with you. We love you.